Hey curlers, welcome back to Chess on Ice. Today, I want to talk about one of the more controversial proposed rule changes in curling, the no tick rule. I'm going to say something I know a lot of you are going to disagree with, but I kind of like the no tick rule. Sorry, sorry, I know. It's not the most popular opinion when you're broomstacking at the end of a game. A lot of people see it as punishment for making a good shot. A lot of people also see it as something that's a little too fiddly that'll complicate playing and watching and explaining curling to others. I think the key thing to keep in mind though is that it will keep games more interesting for longer when we're watching high level events. That's why I think, although of course opinions are spread across the curling spectrum on this potential rule, if you notice, you'll know that more high-level players prefer it than, say, club and mid-level players. Not having the no-tick rule doesn't really affect your average semi-competitive game, and it really doesn't matter for your average club league night. So there's a good reason why elite national and international colors are the ones that are more likely to support this rule change. One of the things I like about it best, though, is that it helps preserve the spirit of the free guard zone rule. Yes, the tick shot gets around the free guard zone rule by making sure that the rock you're hitting stays in play. However, the key thing I just said is that it's getting around the free guard zone rule. What it does is eliminate the relevant guard and turn it into an almost irrelevant rock. That's not really what the free guard zone rule was meant to accomplish. It was meant to increase scoring by keeping relevant rocks in play that teams could hide behind, in turn forcing more draws, more difficult downweight hits, and more rocks in play. Bottom line, sports are supposed to be interesting, entertaining, and have strategic elements. Keeping more of the relevant rocks in play is a good change for curling, at least in my opinion. That said, I do think there's a lot of questions that have to be answered about this rule, so let's go over some of them right now. First of all, the exact nature of the rule should still be up for debate. What does it mean to tick a guard? Where does the guard have to be? There have been suggestions that maybe there are only specific zones, even on the center line, where you get your guard that's not allowed to be ticked. You could put one or two circles up to give the uh, non-hammer team a very difficult target to earn that tick-free guard. You could limit it to one rock per end. You could do a lot of things that would make it easier for teams to generate offense without hammer late in the game without completely changing the game or making it too easy. Those might not even be very good suggestions. I think some of them are even more fiddly than the idea of having to keep track of whether a rock is actually on the center line or not. But the point is, there are a lot of ways you might be able to implement this, and there probably needs to be more experimentation over the coming years, rather than just trying this one version of the rule, deciding whether it's good or not, and going with that. The other thing, and I think this is fairly obvious for most curlers, this is a rule that's completely unnecessary for casual play. That means there's a lot of fear out there that this rule will become adopted, trickle down to become a rule of curling, everyone will have to play it, and then we're going to have a lot of confusion, slower games, and a lot of maintenance every time someone tries to draw around a center guard and clip it, moving in an inch or two. Here's the thing though, I would argue that the rule doesn't have to trickle down. There are a lot of rules that are specific for championship play. The way we time, the kind of rock handles we use, the number of ends we play, the fact that there are officials on the ice, the fact that we practice before games and use last shot draw to determine who has the hammer. None of these rules are normally used in regular league night play, unless you specifically want to for some reason. And that shows that there is a clear divide between rules for championship play and rules for everyone else. Now there's an obvious objection to that. The gameplay, what the players are doing from the first rock of the first end to the last rock of the last end is pretty much identical between the most competitive game you've ever watched on TV and the first game you play in a beginners or casual league at your home club. All the other rules I mentioned have to do with administration, 
determining who has hammer before an important game, how the game is officiated, things like that. But it doesn't have to stay that way. We can have gameplay rules, such as the no tick rule, that do only apply to certain games. I'd have no problem with that, and I think it's something the World Curling Federation and National Federations might want to consider going forward. Then again, it's important to realize that that might only be true for now. Remember that the free guard zone rule, which I think we all love and would have a hard time imagining playing without now, initially came into being only to prevent tactics being used by a very limited number of teams. In the 1993 Briar, which was the last one played before it started using the free guard zone rule, there were only three games with a total score of five or less. In the 1992 Briar, the year before, there were only two such games. So we were pretty far away from being in serious danger of an endless stream of one nothing, two nothing, and two to one games at the time that Elite Events started using the free guard zone rule. That said, if you look down all the scores from those years, you'll notice that the wild, high scoring games had gone away completely. A lot of games were ending with scores like 6 to 4, 5 to 3, 5 to 4, in that range of scoring. And while those games aren't particularly problematic, the fact that that's basically what most curling had become, with no higher scores involved for the most part, meant that a problem was clearly developing. And the curling world responded, saying that we should re inject some offense into the game before this gets worse. In other words, it was a proactive move. It was one designed to stop a problem before it continued to grow and really started to make the game less exciting. That's probably where we are with the no tick rule today. Sure, not everyone's making it, even in high level events, but it is becoming increasingly hard to have exciting late game play in situations that used to generate really exciting finishes. Teams that were tied or up one with the hammer certainly won most of the games if you look at curling 10 years ago. But the percentages for top 10 teams, particularly on the men's side, but also on the women's side, have gone up year after year after year as they become more efficient at defending that lead, opening up the center, and preventing any center guards from getting up. So what does that mean for everyone else? Well, if you think about it, even today, newer and more casual players could play without the free guard zone rule and they wouldn't even notice any significant changes in how their game played out. They're not peeling much anyway, leads often aren't comfortable throwing that much weight, so you wouldn't really have to change the game much at all at those levels, even if the free guard zone rule never came into existence. On the other hand, when you look at your club's competitive night, games that feature at least a few of the better curlers at your club, things like that, you'll notice that the top handful of club teams at your local club are good enough that without the free guard zone rule, the games really wouldn't be as good or interesting. You'd see a lot more peeled guards from leads, a lot lower scoring, and a lot less rocks in play in general. It wouldn't be like if elite teams didn't have to play with the free guard zone rule now. That would be an absolute nightmare and we would see a ton of games where one, two, or three points were scored. But the games would become a lot less interesting for even those sort of semi-competitive players. And that means the free guard zone rule really now, decades after it was very important for elite play, is now important for several levels below that. We may well get to the point where that's also the case for the no tick rule. We have plenty of time before that's true, but even good club teams are getting better at throwing tick shots year after year. I see that at our club. I'm sure it's true at other clubs as well. It's not as though teams are throwing them every end or anything, but there's a lot more leads that are comfortable throwing it and a lot more skips that are comfortable calling it in those late game close situations where they have the hammer and they just want to open things up. Who knows? There might be a time in 10, 20, or 30 years where we all want to play with it because we just can't imagine the game feeling the same way without that no tick rule. But for now, if I have a voice in this at all, my recommendation would be championship play only, keep some of the high level games a little more exciting and interesting and strategically dynamic even into the later ends, use the no tick rule there, experiment with exactly how that rule looks, and 
we'll see how things are in a few years when we can reevaluate. Anyway, that's my opinion, but I know there are tons of opinions on this issue. From people who think the rule's an absolute necessity, to those who think it's the worst rule change in the history of curling. Leave a comment below and let me and everyone else know what you think about the no-tick rule, and where and if you'd like to see it implemented, if at all. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and keep watching as I continue to produce more content for Chess on Ice. Thanks for watching and good curling.